And we are live. Welcome to the final day of Post Tech 2020. That's right, day five. It's Friday. Finally made it to Friday. We did. Uh, we want to start by thanking all of you who have been watching over the last four days. We really appreciate it. We've got a ton of views on YouTube and Facebook. That's right. Thank you so much for all the comments, all the all the response in the chat. We really value that. Um, it's important to us to know that we, you know, we're interacting with the audience. For so sure. Thanks again for that. Yep. All the chat, all the comments on YouTube and Facebook. Um, we we take those seriously. We look at every one of them. So. Thanks for doing Maybe that. Maybe we'll be, we'll be looking at some of them after this. Yes, <laughs> yes, for sure. Doing the total tally. Yeah, So we have sure. kind of a different show for you today. Definitely. Uh, in the, all the, the past four days, we've been looking at machines, all the brand new stuff that we're bringing out, but today it's definitely something different. Yep, so we've got just two people on live today after Andrew and I get out of here. That's so right, we're gonna start with Mark Terryberry, someone you all you all know for sure. Mark Terryberry, Terryberry of Tip of the Day fame. Yep. Um, super popular on this, on this channel, and he's gonna He's gonna walk you through a whole bunch of the a whole bunch of machines here in the demo room and talk about, I think, a bunch of stuff having to do with uh, automation. Yep, he's gonna talk about automation, show you a few options. So, of course, you're here. A lot of you are here for that. Now at 11 a.m. and it's it's 11 a.m. today, not noon like we've been doing. We're gonna have our general manager Bob Murray is gonna come out and give a presentation. Um, if if you think it's gonna be a boring presentation, you couldn't be more wrong. I've sat through several of them, super entertaining, su super informative. He talks about Haas automation, past, present, and future. So you definitely wanna come back for that. Yeah, for sure, stick around for that. 11 a.m., don't miss it. Yep, so one last time, we wanna talk about the promo. We're running a Haas Tech Unlock the Savings promo. That's right, and this is your chance to get that extra 5% off of your order. Um, there's a huge variety of machines uh, on sale right now. So you have until tonight, I'm yep. assuming 12, you know, 12 midnight as I'm keep saying. Yep, today's so the last day. Definitely, if you're looking at, at a machine or you're, you're thinking of buying a machine or more than one machine, definitely get under the building price. Yep, go to HaasCNC.com, you'll see the banner right on the homepage, click in there and you can build and price any machine. So I think that's enough of us because you guys all tuned in to see Mark. Yeah. So Andrew and I are gonna exit stage right. Mark, come on in. Come on in, Mark. <laughs> the stage is all yours. Awesome. Hey guys, it's great to be here finally. I've been watching uh, all the demonstrations, all the, all the cool machines that are coming out online along with you guys. I, I stepped out in the demo room a few times when they were, when they were doing their shows. And there's so much stuff going on in this room right now uh, that they asked me, what's exciting to me? What do I really get excited about? And there are a couple things that I always talk about at trade shows. If I'm talking with someone one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'm talking about different options. People say, what do you want? What do you, what do you really need on a day-to-day -day basis? And I will always, always talk about TSC, through spindle coolant. I'll always talk about probing. Uh, we've made a whole bunch of videos on probing. In fact, maybe I'll link to some of those in the comments section, because uh, I, I love it, because it all helps make my life easier. TSC, probing, they make my life easier which also help us to automate things eventually, right? When you set up stuff today to make tomorrow easier, that's automation. It's kind of my, my definition. Automation equals making my job easier. So, so right now, be sure not to walk away. What I want you to do is get your, get your boss, right? If I was gonna say one thing to every boss I've ever worked for, this is it. In the next few minutes, we're gonna show you how you get from standard machining to automation, all the little bits and pieces along the way that make our life easier. So again, if, uh, if Lynn is watching or Lee or Keith or, uh, or Devin, all my old bosses, this is what I want you to buy and put on a machine to make my life easier, which will make you more money as a shop manager or a shop owner. So they asked me if I had um, a couple different things I wanted to talk about today and, and and I do, I really do. And it, it reminded me of this meme. This is a, a terrible, silly way to start out any type of broadcast, but it's just how I feel. There's this, this show that my kids watch, Parks and Recreation, and there's one scene in this show, and they made a meme out of it, where you've got Chris Pratt, and he's walking into a, a, a pharmacy with his boss, uh, and, and she says, okay, fine, you can go to the candy aisle, He's like, okay, I'll go to the candy aisle, but I won't buy anything. And she says, you can go to the candy aisle and you can buy two candies. And he gets all excited. That's how I feel right now. I'm all excited. But this is not just a sales type video, but at the same time, this is what I want you to buy. So yeah, I don't know if you, got that, if you got that meme up for me or not, but if I've got just one thing I wanted to buy, 
the rules change. If I have two things I want to buy, I'm always going to say TSC and probing because that's just me, right? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But just one thing, they messed me up this week because they added something here to the, to the floor, the demo room. And so uh, I'm going to see, does this count as one thing? And uh, this is the second side of that meme, which I just thought was so cool. This right here is a tool presetter. Now, I, I worked in a lot of shops that didn't have a tool presetter, and I've worked in a lot of shops that did, high volume machining. And so I'm really excited about the tool presetter, but not for the reasons you might think. Uh, we know that it's, you can set your tools offline, and that'll save time uh, when you're changing over parts. But the reason I'm excited about it is because it makes my life easier on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just want to mention some of the things about a tool presetter that, that will change your life as a machinist. Uh, number one, right up here on, the, on the, the screen, I don't know if you can see this, it's not just for setting tool lengths, right? It's basically my, my go-to go measurement tool. And so if I'm coming around here, I can check the runout of my tool. And not only that, I'm not just going to check the run out, right, to make sure everything's running just fine, especially on my drills and reams. But I can also use it as an inspection tool. I'm going to click here on my graphic here. I'm going to rotate this guy through. Actually, let me find a better insert. Oh, that one looks pretty good. I'm looking at the inserts right now. Another great insert there. Oh, man, that one's terrible. Again, that one's terrible. Let me pull the lights up on this guy a little, little bit, see if Tyler can see this. So what you're seeing here is an actual, you know, zoomed in view of, of what I can now see to inspect my inserts. And this changes everything. Before, uh, I used to have to, you know, grab the scope, look at this, but I can now check my inserts while I'm setting them. So it all happens at the same time, uh, if I'm getting a tool length, I'm automatically inspecting them. You can see what's happening. So I'll use that all the time. So the, the, the visual inspection is just a major thing for me. But what I want to talk about right now is something completely different, something you might not expect if, if um, you've always touch off your tools manually or if you've always used a probe. When I started using a tool presetter, it kind of changed my life because I was doing lots of automotive stuff, lots of um, manifolds, lots of engine blocks where you have to get one cross hole to match up with another one. And typically, if you've got a blueprint and I've got something like this, I've got a, a part, uh, let's see here. I've got a part and I have to get the countersink just the right diameter, right? exactly within a, cu a couple thou, so that my diameter has to be perfect on that countersink. Or maybe it's the floor of another part where I've got to get my drill to just the bottom of the hole, and this is gonna be at full diameter. If I touch off a tool by the tip of the tool, that, inc that included angle right there uh, is gonna change, whether it's a 118 degree drill or a 135 or 140. So what I started doing, especially in high volume production, this is not what I was doing for job shop work, but whenever I had long run jobs or critical, critical intersections for drills, um, I basically, we just started programming everything off of full diameter. So when I put a drill in the, in the tool presetter, instead of setting the length at the, at the very tip of the tool, I'm setting it at the shoulder of the tool. And you guys will get the idea. And so if I put this guy in here, let me slide this guy out. I'm going to unlock this, move this up. This is completely uh, foreign for a lot of shops. But again, instead of setting this guy for the, again, you can rotate this guy, bring it up, bring it down. You can set it to automatically go. You can have it automatically find the angle, this type of stuff. But by setting my tool offset to the full diameter of the tool, as soon as I put the tool in there and I press go, if that full diameter of the hole needs to be exactly one inch deep within a really close tolerance, you're going to be right on the very first time. And along those same lines, uh, as a program, I spent so much of my time with tools like this, right? It's a center drill. It's a combination drill. Uh, center drills are combination drills. They're combination drill slash countersinks. And this one right here is an 82 degree uh, countersink. So, if I couldn't find my countersink tool, I would just grab a combination drill to put in the, the countersinks for my flathead machine screws. Um, 82 degrees for my you know, standard stuff or, or 90 degrees for my metric screws. But if the countersink has to be at just the right size, I can put this onto my tool presetter. 
even right here. And we'll take a look at this again. There's my tool. I'm going to lock things down. Bring it down. And if this, if this, um, let me set this to manual instead of automatic here. If this guy has to have a countersink at just the right diameter, then I can set it at that diameter on my tool and program it off of that. And so when the countersink tool comes in, right off the bat, it's going to give me the exact perfect countersink every single time. So I love tool presetters when I'm doing tons of manifold work, lots of engine block work, valve seats, that kind of stuff, because I can set my tools at the diameter, program them as that's my Z0, set my clearance plane appropriately, and as soon as I put the tool in there, I'm saving time. So this is also another piece of automation. I've completely removed the step where I put the drill in the machine, I run it once, I measure it, you know, get my countersink depth gauge, and then I make sure everything's right, and I proof it, and then I make my adjustments to my tool, uh, especially with larger spot drills that have bigger webs at the bottom of the tools. You know, every time you touch them off, the, your countersink, your chamfer diameters vary. So by changing the way you think um, when you touch off tools, especially for high volume work, you can eliminate those steps. You can literally set a tool, right, or pull it right from the tool library, drop it in the machine, press go, and you're gonna have perfect dimensions, full diameter, perfect countersink dimensions, right off the bat, right off the bat, it makes such a big difference. Uh, I've got step drills here doing the exact same thing. The step drill, I want to have the step drill come down and countersink, but on my blueprint, it's a through hole. I've got the countersink dimension, which is important. The tool presetter makes all that work first shot. And of course, if you don't have this guide, I'm just explaining this right now because I love the presetter. I use it for checking run out. I use it for setting my tools for all this uh, cool work. And I'll mention this right now. We've got these like little shop notes. If we were at uh, IMTS right now, we'd be handing these out. But you can download this right off the website and we'll link to that. But you can calculate these countersink depths or the, the drill point depths. Now typically with a 118 degree drill, you can just multiply the drill diameter by 0.3 and that will give you the, that will give you the drill point length. But again, on a standard you know, 13 millimeter drill, half inch drill, that drill point is gonna vary by 60 thou, you know, 1.5 millimeter or a 16th of an inch depending on whether that drill is 118 degrees included or 140 degrees included. So you touch it off, but your full diameter is going to vary by a 16th of an inch depending on what your drill point angle is. And if the drill is a regrind, you're not quite sure. So you've got to run it, measure it, rerun it. The tool presetter gets rid of all that guesswork, which is why I, I really love this machine. And I'll show you a few other things here. There's actually if you get one of these things, which are coming out, I think by the end of the year, uh, really, really cool. Um, don't have to show you how it works. You'll, un you'll figure that stuff out when you get one. But I love it. The only thing I can say about this is that I want one. So if I've got just one option to buy on a machine, uh, this is more of an option for a shop because it'll apply to all of your machines in your shop. You can use it for all of them. It would be this guy right here. Um, some little things you're gonna wanna look at is that, and we'll probably ship the machines, the presetters with this. If you can't see the edge of your tool really well, like there's a bunch of fuzz on there. I just messed up your shot, it was there. It was really difficult to see. I dabbed it with this erasable, uh, or sorry, this kneadable eraser. And so you can buy an, uh, a kneadable eraser, but we'll probably ship the machine with one. If you don't have that with it, you can just go down to the, the local pharmacy and buy some, um, some Loctite fun tack. But it's really just any type of adhesive putty that you can use to clean the edges of your tools so you can see them better. And that's just a nice thing to have around for um, no matter what tools you're working on. So typically for this guy, we'll take it, we'll print it, and we're on our way. And of course, once you print out the sticker, which we could do, the nice thing about this guy, which is just exciting for me, because I've never had this on machines I've worked on before. I've always had to hand enter the data at the machine. The fact that we can just print out the sticker after getting those, those tool diameters, scan it, and it's going, to, it's going to input that data right into the Haas machine for us, is just something you, you won't easily find uh, without some heavy duty integration. So they're gonna match all this up into a package and this is kind of this week uh, the most exciting thing that I've seen. Although, <laughs> now that I see this thing, this room is full of really cool stuff right now that's not normally here. You gotta check this out. I gotta move this. 
talk about automation, automation is anything that makes my job easier, right? If it makes my job easier, that's automation. It saves me from having to do some manual work. And this is one of those things. Typically on a machine, we've got, um, if you have the auger chip conveyor, we have a low rise exhaust chute here for the chips, the chip chute. And if you wanted to fill up a great big giant drum or let the machine run longer before you change the chips, you can't. You've got to keep changing out those smaller totes, those smaller buckets. But this is a chip lift, which has uh, just been out here on the shop floor for a little bit. I see them running out in the machine shop. This will actually take the chips, push them up and out of the, out of the machine for you into a standard 55-gallon drum. So this is just one of those things that Haas has been thinking about a lot. And it's all part of automation. Because if you cannot turn your back on the machine, if you can't walk away, you'll never be able to get from a standard machine to a fully automated machine. And I'm not even sure that a fully autom automated machine is the sole answer, right? That might not be the goal for your shop, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be automating um, as much as you can along the way. Uh, I'll just say this, during the World War II, they stopped the production of washer machines, and then during the 40s and 50s, they really became popular. But no one said, I'm not gonna buy a washer machine because I'm not going to buy a washing machine because, you know, it doesn't come with a robot to load the washing machine for me. So in the background, you can see there's a robot down there. I just turned it off because it was beeping at me. Uh, I didn't want to make it making noise while I'm talking. But nobody's not going to buy a washing machine just because they don't have a robot to load the washing machine for them. That's kind of one of the, the points I want to make is that you, you can take incremental steps towards full automation every day, and we should be. Do something today that will make your life easier tomorrow. And the work holding behind me kind of um, plays right into this. We've got vices here. You saw this on the, the HaasTooling.com site. Keep checking that out. They're adding stuff all the time. But the best way to automate something is to remove the process altogether. So I made a video. We made one a few years ago on how to make a vice straight. And it was a great video, right? It was fun. We showed them how to make the vice straight. But then in the comments of that video, everyone's saying the same thing. Why, why spend the time making a vice straight? Why don't you just use a zero point system or, or even a slot, a dowel pin in the table so you just remove the vice and you just drop it on. Remove the entire process. So what we've got here is a vice that's got the zero point fixtures that can be dropped onto a subplate for us. So we've automated the entire process of making a vice straight by removing it. And right here, tightening this vice, which manual vices are here to stay. I'm always gonna need manual vices for a lot of things. But there are times when I can, I can automate around that and simply replace it with a vise that is fully pneumatic, that opens and closes for me. And just because you don't have a robot doesn't mean that this won't have real benefits. Um, so right now we've got this guy over here. This is a subplate. You can see that these guys lift in and out. This is a zero point fixture that we're gonna be selling uh, soon. Well, I say soon, we actually have this right now on our TR210 models. This guy right here is a TRT160, and it's got the same zero-point fixtures. These are, these are just pucks that you can buy. You could make your own, uh, that you can mount your own vices onto, your own um, fixtures, your own you know, dovetails, um, anything you like. But all I'm getting at here is that we completely removed, <laughs> we removed the entire setup from the process, which is going to make your life easier tomorrow. And so you just want to keep moving towards that. Whatever you can do bit by bit, and that might not be an APL, or it might not be a robot uh, today, but keep working towards that automation and, and you'll, you'll really uh, be happy as, as the future comes, whether we want it to or not. Uh, in fact, it's a kind of a sign of maturity, right? That you plan for tomorrow and not just for today. And so automate, you're gonna make your life so much easier in the near future. Uh, what's also unique about this system right here, and it kind of plays into the UMC behind me, is that we hook up airlines to these guys. And um, I'll mention this now. If you're looking at a zero point system, uh, the one that we've got right here and it's coming out and it's on the TRT210 is kind of unique and it's kind of cool. And it's got uh, air being fed into the system from both the top and the bottom of the piston. So if I were to clamp this guy here and push the foot pedal, this would normally be routed with the air all the way through the system. If we clamp on this guy with, with no air pressure, we just have the, the spring inside holding it down, that's gonna give us, oh gosh, you know, like, you know, uh, 1,000 kilograms of holding power. That's 2,200 pounds of holding power. But if we run a 
double pneumatic switch, it'll push air from the top down, and that'll give us 2,700 kilograms of holding force on this particular model of zero point fixture. That is a lot of clamping force, more than we would ever need. So if you think that a pneumatic system can't handle what you wanna do, uh, try it out. There's, there's a lot of holding force there. In fact, even this guy with some of these pneumatic fixtures that we've got here, Right now, this vice setup right here, uh, with the same type of system running at seven bar, 100 PSI, it's gonna give us 35,000 newtons, right? You know, 35 kilonewtons of holding power, which is near 8,000 pounds. It's insane. It's just crazy amount of holding force with just a pneumatic fixture. And what's unique about it, these systems, again, is that we're completely automating the process. You don't even have to hook up the airlines to most of these systems it's running the air through the center of the pallet system. In fact, let's do this. This one's actually running hydraulic. This is a really cool system. Hydraulic system is gonna run hydraulic through this. You can buy the TR210 today with this option. You can buy a UMC with this option right now for the hydraulic run down the center of the machine. And here, Sal, take a look in here. And if you look right down the center of that table, you're gonna see that there's a, there's a few small holes and the hydraulic is actually plumbed right down the middle of this machine. And it's being fed by this hydraulic pump here. And so what do I have to do to hook everything up? I just bolt my vise on, on the bottom of this vise, there's hydraulic fittings, drop it right on and everything works. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be a machinist and that everything we're doing is just getting easier and easier and easier. I'm gonna close this door for a second. Here, check this out. Imagine, if you will, that this guy is rotating around. The air and the hydraulic lines are inside the table. We've mounted them all for you. So we have that option available today on the UMCs and just keep looking for more and more of this automation. But again, as we head from kind of our, our standard TL and TM machines towards the full robotics, there's a few things that we just have to watch out for, a few things that we've got to do. And, and number one, you have to have a reliable process to get to that point. If you don't have a reliable way of making parts repeatably, reliably, without the machine having problems, then um, you can't put a robot to it. You can't have an auto loader. You have to have a reliable process. And I have this strange philosophy about, about automation, um, and I think it kind of all starts with the tooling. I think that machining in general all starts out with the tooling. This is a regular, uh, uh, you know, high-speed steel. Actually, this is braised carbide. No, it's high-speed. Uh, stick tool. So back, if we were looking at our grandfathers back in the 30s and 40s, if they were machining, they were using high-speed steel tools, right? And then what happened is they switched the metals, right? They added more chromium, vanadium, um, molybdenum to the tools, and they gave us better tool steels. Now, just by going from that regular steel to a, to a high-speed steel, they were able to just double the, the, the tool life, right? They were able to run these things at twice the RPM without having them melt. And today, with all the HaasTooling.com tools you have over there, we have lots of high-speed steel tools that have, um, they're either like M35, which is 5% cobalt. You've got the M42s, which are 8% cobalt. The M35s, if you look on a tool and it says HSS-E, E is an Edward, then you've got, uh, you've got an M35 tool. That's 5% cobalt. And then if you've got the uh, regular high-speed steel, HSS-CO, that's typically an M42 tool steel, and you can run that guy 50% faster or twice as fast. If you start running the carbide tools, you can run those 10 times faster than the cobalt, right? And that just gets better and better and better. The problem is by running these tools faster and faster is that you can't get rid of the chips fast enough which brings us back to my, my number one option. If you're a shop owner and you're looking at buying a machine, uh, I will be a salesman all day long when it comes to coolant. You can't put a robot on a machine that can't get the chips out of the way because it's not running reliably. So you have to run things slower, you gotta reduce your pecs. Uh, it becomes very hard to run a machine that can't run consistently. And for me as a machinist, it, TSC, through spindle coolant, or high volume, high pressure coolants, changed my life. Let's sneak around here. We're gonna take a look at this, at this, uh, this Kuma pump here on the floor. And I just wanna to explain to you guys about some options and tell you about the differences between them so you're more aware. And, and whether you've, you're, you already have a machine or you're in the market or you're not, um, we just gotta explain this. It's really, really cool. Uh, this coolant pump right here, 
I've got a part sitting on top of it because I was running this part a couple weeks ago over at the other facility that we were doing a TOD on. And when I was running the drill on this, this is an aluminum part, it was a setup piece. And when I was running it uh, on steel, maybe 300 uh, meters a minute, a thousand surface foot, I was probably running six, seven, eight thou per revolution on the drill and it sounded terrible. It was like Ozzy Osbourne with a, uh, a mouthful of gravel. That drill was working really, really hard trying to, to come in and push those chips, and it shouldn't have been. I'm like, this drill is terrible. The drill is awful. Well, I, I was on a machine, and I, this is embarrassing to say, but I hadn't used the machine before. It was just delivered, and I was using an M8 to power that drill. Coolant was coming out of the drill. And um, in fact, go ahead and play the video for us of the, of the lathe TSC drill. Well, let's talk about this while that video is playing. So while I was running that part, I was pushing through the material and it was crunching. The sound was going cha 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 cha. So what I did is I, I slowed down the drill. I had to add a peck to my drill. I was running a 32 millimeter inch and a quarter drill and I was going, you know, three, four, five X D. And I kept having to slow it down. And then I walked around the back of the machine and what I saw was a high pressure coolant pump. It was running a 300 PSI coolant pump. And I'm like, oh no. I had the coolant pump to fix this problem all along and I wasn't using it. I switched from an M8 to the M88 and all my problems went away. I was able to bump my feed per revolution from 6,000 to 10,000 per revolution. Well, actually, I had already lowered it from there. Uh, but I was able to bump my feed rates up. And again, yes, the part ran faster. But why I was excited about it as a machinist is I could now turn my back in the machine. I wasn't, I wasn't anxious. Like if you left the house this morning and you were thinking to yourself, did I leave the stove on? This is the answer. The answer to me is good coolant and chip management. Kind of like the, the chip lift over there, making sure the chips are getting out of the machine. The way they de designed this new UMC with the chip conveyor right down the center. All these options that allow us to get coolant where it needs to go have just made my life bearable as a machinist. And it's, it's not a new problem. Let me show you this. So they've been machining for a long time, right? forever. Uh, but really, modern machines, even the manual machines, really started turning up in the mid-1800s. This is an article that I, I, I pulled up. It's on Google Books. You can find this thing. And it's from American Machinist. It was a journal. It still is a journal. You can go on, uh, online and look it up. But I'll sit down and I'll look through these posts. Uh, and if you want to find these posts, you can email me at tod at haascnc.com. I'll send you the link. But this is an article, it was an editorial that this guy put in. Uh, this is Godfrey Whitaker from Westfield, Massachusetts, August 10th, 1899. And see if you can sympathize with his problem. He says, we have been hoping for a proper means of keeping an adequate supply of water upon the tool and work. In our opinion, no possible combination of improvements would add a tithe to the efficiency of machine tools more than a stream of soda water. So he's writing to the magazine and at this point, you didn't have good coolant on your tools. And he's saying, if we could find some way to get soda water on there, it would solve my problems. High-speed steels didn't need, didn't need lubrication. They really needed the, 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 just water to cool the tool because they didn't have the high-speed steels yet. And so they were melting the tools, so the water helped that. And when they're talking about soda water, they don't mean Pepsi or Coke. Uh, they're talking about soda ash, right? If you're a machinist from a couple hundred years ago, from 100 years ago, you wouldn't be adding uh, coolant to your machine like we are now, you know, semi-synthetic. You'd be adding sodium carbonate, uh, which keeps the rust out of your water as you cool down your tools. So that's soda water is just soda ash. He says, what we believe to be required is a general line of machine tools in which this element is a living feature of the design. Machines so constructed that by no chance could the soda water get it at the working parts. With a stream of water not only sufficient to keep the tool cool, but that would wash all the chips into a proper receptacle below and keep the deck at all times clean and clear for action. We believe that machines constructed with a fair provision for holding a tomato can would be recognized as an improvement, tomato can being filled with the soda water, uh, that a copious stream of water properly taken care of would be a revelation for efficiency and cleanliness. Again, American Machinist, 1899. Uh, I didn't search for this, I actually, this is, kind of geeky. I'll sit down there and I'll read through all these old posts. They've got, they've got 50 years of these archives. Uh, it's, it's pretty fun stuff to see what machinists day-to-day -day lives were uh, 100 years ago. But again, our lives are automated. Our lives have become easier because of things like the, the live 
to a coolant um, on the machines, the high pressure coolant. And what we've got new now, if you're going through the build and price today, which you should be, you should be going out to the HaasCNC.com website, going through a build and price uh, because everything's on sale like today. Go check it out. Uh, even all the options I'm talking about are, are, are discounted with the price of the machine. But um, let me play this video right now. This video is on flood coolant for the regular machines. We've changed the way that the, the regular coolant works on a machine. You have a coolant ring that goes around the machine. You've got your programmable coolant P cool. And what they've done is they've added a great big giant enormous motor to the standard system. They've reinforced all the coolant lines to the machines. And they're giving us a, a high pressure, high volume coolant flow on our machines. Uh, it's the next best thing to TSC coolant, but it's really uh, cheap comparatively. And it's exciting because this is a problem or rather it's a solution to just about every problem we've got. This type of high volume, high pressure flood coolant is gonna allow you to turn your back on the machine. It's gonna allow you to run consistently. And uh, what they've done is they've added a bigger motor to the machine and solved all kinds of problems. And this is just one of the solutions that, that Haas has offered because I said that automation is kind of anything that makes my job easier. So I guess in a way Haas automation is just Haas makes my job easier. And that's what they're doing. Uh, this place is run by machinists. I've been, I've been here almost 10 years, but I'm always blown away by the management here because I always find out that they used to run machine shops or they've ran this machine shop. Even our sales and marketing guy used to run the machine shop. They all, they all get it. They all know what's going on. And when you've got an M35 or an M42 high-speed drill going to a carbide drill, going to a, a TICN drill like John was talking about yesterday, and you're bumping your feed rates 10 times and then 40% on top of that for the, for the TICN. And now you're going to a Talon drill, a TIALN, and you're doubling that. Our feeds and speeds are becoming ridiculous. We've got chips that we just can't handle and Haas is dealing with it in a lot of different ways. Another way that we're taking care of this is, um, is with a new option, it's called variable flow coolant. And you'll see this underneath the options list online. So we'll play that video now. This is on variable flow coolant. If, if you have a machine that has this, you can go up and instead of programming an M8 to turn on your coolant, again, TSC would be M88 typically uh, for the high pressure coolant, the, like 300 or 1000 PSI. But with the VFD, the variable frequency drive or the variable flow coolant, you can program an M8 P0 for normal coolant or low coolant, a P1 for standard coolant or a P2 for, for high pressure coolant. And this is kind of with the standard coolant pump that's already on your Haas mill or lathe. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting way they're accomplishing this. So, so why would you want the high volume flood coolant or why would you want the variable flow coolant? One gives you more control. You can go up or down with the, the, the coolant pressure. And one just gives you way more flow, like, like a ton more, uh, like 14 gallons a minute, 53 liters a minute, or up to 60 PSI on the, on the flood coolant. The variable flow is still using the standard pump, but it is giving you a higher pressure, uh, but it also allows you to go lower. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just say this, I don't know what, what time we've got, but for me, understanding these frequencies and, and how they're getting away with this is, um, is something I've heard of before. It's actually gotten me a few jobs. Check this out. So 10 years ago or whatever, I was doing uh, cylinder heads for, for the big three. The company that I was working for was making cylinder heads. That's what they did. Uh, and engine blocks and that type of thing. But we got in a job from, from Japan, from one of the Japanese automakers. I've got NDAs and I can't say who or, or what exactly, but um, it was a great job. I had a lot of fun working with those guys. What happened in 2011 was the Fukushima nuclear disaster, right? And so after that, after that nuclear disaster and the power plant went down, we started getting all this work from the Japanese car makers because they didn't have the facilities to run it. But here's the catch, there was nothing wrong with their facilities. Japan is really odd. The western side of Japan, right, you know, Kyoto, those type of areas, those are all running on 60 hertz power. And on the, the eastern side of the country, uh, like Tokyo, those type of places, um, uh, Yokohama, all those guys were running at 50 hertz. And so that was the side of the country that had the, the nuclear disaster. So when they lost power, the country had plenty of power, but they couldn't switch it from 50 hertz to 60 hertz. Well, it's, it's a crazy thing. That, that problem, why Japan is split, and why for years your clock would run fast or slow in Japan, whether it was plugged in on the east side or the west side of the country, um, 
it, that all changed back in 1895, 1896. So you had the Germans came in with, with their general electric company, AEG, and put out 50 hertz power equipment on the east side of the company, or the east side of the country. And then you had General Electric from the US come out with 60 hertz power on the west side of the country, and it just became too expensive to switch over at some point. But anyhow, that's my little story. So I ended up doing a lot of cylinder head work because of the differences between 50 and 60 hertz. The variable frequency drive that we're doing is basically giving you 50, 60, 80 hertz. It's playing with all those frequencies to get more uh, out, of the, out of the coolant pumps that we're, that we're selling. They're all matched together for this process. And so um, it, depending on where you are, if you want control, go with the variable flow. Otherwise, uh, just go with the high, high flow, high volume coolant pump that we showed you uh, earlier. We're going to walk down this way, and I'm going to show you a couple more things before we let you go. Oh, this is silly, but I'm going to mention it because people kept calling me over the last month. This is just a bottle of 70% 70, uh, 70 alcohol, and this is for the HTEC guys, all the schools. They keep calling up and asking, can we clean our machines, our front panels, and disinfect them uh, without worrying about hurting the front of the control. Absolutely. So these controls, I've got my machines over there in the other photo area, and I've been spraying them down three, four times a day for the last month to make sure everything's fine, but they are totally fine. Uh, but beyond that, when we send things out and we, when we make it here, all these touch panels, the screens themselves, the buttons, the knobs, they can all handle the 70% alcohol just fine. And if you go onto the CDC website, they'll give you more instructions of what you can do to disinfect a machine if you really need to. Uh, they've got even options for using bleach, you know, four teaspoons per quart. Uh, it's a really low concentration of bleach. That's fine too. I've been checking all that. All of our vendors are aware of that. So you can disinfect your machines without worrying about it. I just want to mention that for the HTEC guys. But now we're going to move over here to our, our robot cell. I'm going to hit go on this one time. We're going to watch this robot cell go. It's going to be swapping some parts for us here. It's loading up. But again, just because you're not going to buy a robot today doesn't mean you don't automate, OK? And when Henry Ford started the production line, you know, whatever, back in the 19 aughts, 1908, he started making the, the Model Ts, and 1913, he really got things going. He made 15, model, 15 million Model Ts by the time that line closed in 1927. But in my view, his, his genius wasn't the assembly line. His genius was the, the Ford machinist, because they were able to machine perfect parts every time that would go together on the assembly line. The bolts fit. And again, my twisted view of, of, of automation for me personally, it all starts with coolant. I want as much coolant on my parts as possible because if I've got lots of coolant on my parts, I can run <laughs> confidently, I can walk away from the machine, and then I can automate. Now this part's running right here. I'll stop in a second. And I'm going to show you the devices on the table and, and just two more things that you would need before you automate. I'm going to stop that guy right there. We're going to clear this guy out. All the fancy stuff. I'm going to let Sal sneak in there. I kind of stopped it at a funny spot. But go ahead and go in there. On that table right now, you've got uh, a few different things. One of the coolest things that I've got that I want to share with you guys, that, that everything I've talked about today is all the stuff you would need to think about if you're going to automate, right? The real stuff that you've got to do. Now, programming the robot and stuff like that, I'm not even going to talk about because it's easy. That's not even programming anymore. They've got VPS templates on the control. You answer the questions. You jog it around. That stuff's going to be easy. But it all starts by having that programmable, programmable error on the table. That's on the far left of the table right now. And that's an option that you can buy on your machine right now, even if you don't have a robot. You can buy that today. And that allows you to use M codes to blast the, the parts off right before you load them. So today, you could automate your vices. You can add programmable coolant. You can add programmable air to your machine. Do everything you can to automate. You can get TSC, which helps automate. It helps you be able to walk away from the machine. You're going to have the probing, for sure, which allows you to automate. And again, we posted the links to a bunch of probing videos that we've made, so you can check those out. And that center vice is uh, run with pneumatics. The right one's the E vice. But again, all of this starts, frankly, None of that would be possible without good chip and coolant management. Uh, so when you're buying a machine, uh, please, if, if, if I was going to the shop manager, if I was going to the owner of the company who was buying equipment, uh, think twice. Please look at flood coolant, please, I mean, a high volume, high pressure flood coolants. 
please look at the, the variable you know, frequency coolant if you need to go high or low, but normally more is better, right? I'd like TSC if I can. Whatever I can, whatever I can uh, take, I'll, I'll take as a machinist, because that's gonna make my life easier as a machinist. One last thing, as we come over here, I'll mention this. This is just one last thing that we're gonna show you before we go talking about how we got the automation working. Now, we, they've talked about the robot all week, and you've seen some awesome five-axis machines. But again, automation kind of starts with the little stuff. It's about chip management, right? It's about tool management. It's, it's about this guy right here, which is our air blast in the lathe. It's an option. Uh, you got to have it. You can make your own. You could. You could um, get the, uh, the um, M code options, right? The expansions, and you could create your own relays and pneumatic solenoids and that kind of stuff. But we just made it easy for you. And so we've integrated it into the control with our own M codes. So the air blast here blows the chips off. There's no reason you can't have the machine do this for you right now. If you buy a regular ST20, you can buy the air blast option so you don't have to open the door and blow it off. In fact, you shouldn't have to open the door at all, right? You should go turn on setting 113, turn on the auto door. So when the program finishes, it opens the door for you. That's automation. You don't have to have the robot to get that stuff. You can automate the door right now. You press cycle start, it closes the door for you. Anything we can, we can actually remove from the process is going to make things run faster and better. And, and people like me, the machinists, the guys running the part, are going to be so much happier. We're going to have more time in the day to do other things that make us more money. And we need you guys to make money, right, to keep us in business. And so we're doing everything we can to keep your lights on and keeping you efficient. But again, the air blast option, it's just an, a necessity, I think, uh, to blow those chips off. And it's a first step before you can even get the robot because we need this thing running consistently. Aside from that, a kind of fun thing here, and it's the last thing I'm going to talk about today, is the, the pusher, right? If you buy the robot system, you need to be able to make sure that the parts are well seated in the chuck. And so you might not have seen this before, but uh, we make this, we sell it with the kits. If you really want it, maybe you can start... Uh, bug in your dealers or send us some emails. We'll sell it as an individual accessory. I don't think it comes by itself right now. Uh, it comes with our other autom automation kits like the APLs and the, the robot packages. Uh, but I just thought it was really clever. It's a very simple way. They took quarter inch uh, piano wire, uh, you know, spring steel, and got that, that plunger on there, got all the pieces there. So the chuck opens, it forces the part up against the chuck, releases. And it's just one more thing that removes the operator from the process. So, so that's, that's my tour of, uh, I'm gonna walk back in front of the UMC now as we swing back around. That's my tour of the demo room today. And there's just so much cool stuff here. Uh, but again, it's kind of cheating. If I had to choose one thing to walk home with today, if they said I had one option, well, I'm taking the tool presetter uh, <laughs> because you know they didn't say I couldn't if that was the setup. Because I love the tool presetter because it makes my life easier as a machinist. And one thing I didn't mention there as well in the tool presetter was that um, boring bars. If you guys are setting boring bars right now, you set it manually, you drill a hole, you set the boring bar small, you bore the hole, you come out, you get a bore gauge, you get a tenth indicator on the, on the, on the, the bore gauge, you set that, you bring it out and in based on your bore. You go back and forth setting up your, your boring tools, right? your boring bars. If you have a tool presetter, you put it on there, you swing it around until it reads the right number and you're done. Then during production, you might you know, have to move it a tenth or two one way or another. But you remove half of the setup time, half of the, the headache with using boring bars when you use a tool presetter. So I love tool presetters just for that reason. Uh, so that is it for this Haas Tech tip of the day. But be sure to come back at 11 o'clock because you don't want to miss what Bob Murray has to, to show us. And again, just the same thing Andrew and Brian were talking about. I'm always excited to hear what Bob has to say. It's kind of an insight for us as to the world of machining and, and the world of Haas and where things are going, where things have been. So I always learn something when I listen to him. Uh, that's it. Thanks for letting us be a part of your success and for watching this Haas Tech Tip of the Day.